And now, please welcome Richard Brown. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Brown. I'm with American Express, Vice President for Philanthropy. 50 years ago, New York led the country in passing the 1965 Landmarks Preservation Law. Mass fought for the law's passage. The National Trust for Historic Preservation took the idea of historic preservation to the nation, and the World Monuments Fund brought it to the world. Half a century later, preservation and adaptive building reuse are well-established tools for managing change, spurring economic growth, and contributing to the betterment of vibrant, sustainable communities. This afternoon, I am pleased to introduce a panel that features the leaders of the two, these two American Express key partners in preservation, Bonnie Burnham of the World Monuments Fund and Stephanie Meeks of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the World Monuments Fund's extraordinary 50th, 50th anniversary at Hadrian Gala last night, where Bonnie was celebrated for her 30 years of service to the fund and her lifelong commitment to the worldwide preservation movement. Congratulations once more to Bonnie, who will be out in a moment. Collaborating with these two stellar institutions, American Express is supporting iconic cultural sites domestically and abroad and celebrating important milestones in historic preservation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Ma Mass Board Member Manuela Holters Holterhoff, who will, who will moderate a discussion on legacy built by these two organizations, the ways the landscape of preservation has changed since 1965, and what's next for the landmark law. Thank you very much. So, uh, Bonnie, Stephanie, everyone, I think uh, depending on where we sit, there's good news and bad news. Um, last night, uh, you had the Hadrian uh, Gala. You celebrated and honored two significant supporters of landmarks. Um, one, Queen Sophia of Spain. The other, Sheikha May of Bahrain, the kingdom, the island kingdom. You also put out your, 50, your watch list of 50 endangered sites. There was one that was particularly intriguing, and that was called Anonymous, and it was an empty picture. Tell us what the thinking was behind that. Well, it's, it's actually called the Unnamed Monument, and it addresses the situation in the Middle East where there's so much damage occurring at so many sites that you can't even name them all. Oh. And it's all in the interest of propaganda as well as uh, keeping the terrorism engine going by selling antiquities that can, can be looted uh, in those circumstances. And the, the preservation field's beginning to worry about the idea of giving too much credibility to this. So the idea of not naming a site, not expressing outrage, but instead trying to just call attention or, or side with empathy for what's happening in the region and in particular for the people whose lives are affected by it. Right, because you also bring happiness to the perpetrators uh, by, by focusing on, 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 what, on what they have, have done. What can, what can we do beyond being outraged? Um, is there a role for UNESCO um, to amplify its presence? Yes, well, there are two or three things. First of all, UNESCO is calling for a strengthening of the convention that deals with uh, conflict in, in circumstances like this or protection of cultural heritage, trying to get countries to, and particularly the Western countries, to actually devote resources to the defense of cultural heritage, which can be done through vehicles like uh, peacekeeping forces not operable today in Syria, but maybe relatively soon uh, there. But public awareness, particularly about antiquities trade and the, and the role that that plays in terrorism is, is quite important, I think. And uh, uh, legislating around the world yeah. for uh, prevention of, of in, uh, introduction of looted antiquities into the marketplace. Stephanie, you have a small, you have only part of the world uh, <laughs> to, to protect. Um, I think you also have a list of endangered landmarks, monuments, sites. Can you tell us, uh, can you give us an, an idea of the variety? 
Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here with you. We do an, an annual list, just as the World Monuments Fund does. We call it the 11 most endangered places in the United States. We've been doing this list for 27 years. And we have had a remarkable track record with it, uh, working with our community partners across the country. Fewer than 3% of those sites have been lost over the 27-year period. Um, and, and we uh, have a, a wide array from landmarks to um, landscapes like the Palisades here in New York to places like the Houston Astrodome. Mm -hmm. So we using our list to engage people and, and we want a broad variety of, of projects. How do you winnow it out? Um, you have field offices all over America, I believe, uh, but also to what extent do you engage the public, the people of, who are often living around these landmarks or even within them? Right. Well, that's right. And, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think one of the ways that preservation needs to continue to strengthen in the United States is by re-engaging the community in, in preservation. Over the past 50 years, it's become a very concentrated and sort of hyper-professional industry, both from a regulatory standpoint and also from the profession. And I believe that sometimes we've separated ourselves somewhat from the community. So we are always looking for ways to bring the community back into the conversation. The 11 most endangered list is an example of that. We invite nominations from the public. We do vet them internally and with partners. And we're looking for the ones that will make, uh, where we think that the listing can really help drive a, a successful outcome. You've been at the World Monuments Fund now 30 years. Take us back to one of the earliest projects that you worked on. Well, I, uh, when I came to the organization, it was almost entirely focused on Venice. And it, was because it really got its roots there in the mm -hmm. 1960s. And I always think of the parallel between the destruction of, Grand, of uh, Penn Station and the flood in Venice, which occurred in a sort of similar window of time. Galvanizing. In the 60s, the, as a galvanizing moment for historic yeah. preservation, both uh, in the US and around the world. But uh, we became focused on catastrophic response as a result of that. And one of the next big things was catastrophic response in Mexico City in 1985. That was the first big event I had to deal with. And then the earthquake. It, yes, mm -hmm. uh, where the whole historic center was, was deeply affected in a lot of the most important buildings and works of art that were part of those buildings. And then uh, Angkor in Cambodia, where we were entering as, essentially even though it had been 20 years since the Khmer Rouge had been out of power, it was a post-catastrophic situation because so many people had been killed. And what was Prayer Khan like at that time? It must have been totally impoverished. Were there actually people? You, your whole idea is to involve the public with reconstructing, mm -hmm. with working on their own monuments. Who was there? Who was left? Well, there were actually communities living within the Angkor Park. Mm. And the monuments, with the exception of Angkor Wat, were almost completely abandoned to nature. So they were covered with vines. You had to kind of hack your way in there. But it was quite easy to engage the local community uh, as a workforce. And uh, actually, the leader of our expedition at the time went to the university and proselytized to the students in Phnom Penh to become involved in this preservation effort. And none of them had ever seen Angkor. And there were no pictures. They destroyed all the books. So the were there any roads? How did you get there? There, uh, there were boats on the river. And uh, you know, it took about six hours. And, and uh, they went down with the students and stayed there you know, for a couple of weeks. And about half a dozen of them stayed on and eventually became team members. So we were able to create uh, a team that has, uh, for, the, for the most part, continued now mm -hmm. for 25 years. Some of the same people from that first graduating class of the university are still with us. So it's, it, you can galvanize people just out of the public uh, because they understand how important it is. And, and preservation is much more part of a national conversation. Uh, but is it still difficult to make that connection with preservation as a path to prosperity um, when you talk to local groups saying, you know, we really should preserve it, or when you talk to developers? 
It can be sometimes. Uh, so much of the answer to that question depends on who's the mayor and who's on city council and how much they understand the power of preservation as a revitalizing force for communities. We published a report at the National Trust last year called Older, Smaller, Better, which talks about the economic value of historic buildings and as, as a jump start. And it, it starts with a thesis that Jane Jacobs uh, submitted 50 years ago. She is sort of famously saying in the death and life of American cities that cities need old buildings so badly it's probably impossible for streets and districts to thrive without them. And we set out to prove or disprove that thesis in this report that we did, looking at a number of, of different metrics, um, buildings across the city, not just the historic buildings. And we looked at number of jobs, number of people living there, um, walk scores, et cetera. And what we found is that Jane Jacobs was really right, that where there are concentrations of historic buildings, there is greater density per square footage. There are, is a greater number of women and minority-owned businesses. There's a greater number of small businesses. There's a greater number of creative businesses. So we think she was right that that cities do need mm -hmm. old buildings. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're trying to get that word out to the city councils and the mayors that haven't mm -hmm. yet heard that message. What's a, what's a project you're working on right now um, in trying to get that message out? Well, we're, we're trying to get that message out ac across the country, but one in particular where we're working is in Louisville, Kentucky, where we've been invited in to do this mapping project, which also, interestingly, I should say, um, overlays cell phone usage patterns and shows... <laughs> and where the defibrillator is? Or, yeah. <laughs> well, and I just want to say the NSA is not involved, but with the, 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 <laughs> we use uh, cell phone usage patterns, and what it shows is that there are high concentrations of people in historic buildings um, on places like Saturday night. So they're, they're magnets for people to come mm -hmm. to restaurants and, and galleries and clubs and that kind of thing, which is just one of the many data sets that we looked at. But we're looking in Louisville, for example, but also in big cities in Chicago and Baltimore. Um, we would love to bring this methodology to New York and we're trying to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. And you, Bonnie, uh, let's get back to uh, the list. Um, how, do, how do we, contribute to the welfare, to the preservation of these 50 sites? Well, uh, often when we launch the watch list, we have petitions that people can sign. And uh, the last list had the Palisades on it. And uh, the response to that w was really important in trying to reanimate the, the discussion that was going on with the nature conservation groups, but mm -hmm. was bobbed down with court decisions and so forth. We also had a petition in support of the country of Syria being listed on the watch, and uh, the, the entire country, the, in, the entire country in well, 2014. Is that the first? Uh, no, we've listed Iraq and Mali, <laughs> uh, but that's why this time we chose not to do that. Instead, uh, did not name. But actually, the petition in support of the director of antiquities in Syria really substantially supported his position because he was seen in, by the outside world as a member of the Assad regime and held under suspicion, whereas in fact he was this heroic person trying to keep yeah. his staff together and trying to address as many of these emergencies as he could. Uh, out of the watch comes uh, a program called Watch Day where each community is invited to celebrate their monument in some way. And uh, so that's another way of local uh, mm -hmm. participation. Um, this current list, we do, do not have a site in New York City. But is that I, a first? Um, no, I think we've probably had six or eight sites in yeah. New York City over the, course of, over the course of time. But we're actually following what the National Trust is doing now with the New York State Pavilion, because that was something that right. was previously on the watch and where there hasn't been the kind of political leadership we mm -hmm. need to, uh, to move that discussion forward. But I think simply being knowledgeable, uh, participating mm -hmm. in social media, uh, which we have up on our website all the time. Uh, people contribute pictures, they contribute comments about the places where they've been, comments about the places yeah. on the watch. To get down to 50, what did you start with? We started with 100. Oh. And both numbers happen to be arbitrary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we find that we can be more effective in a proactive way by having fewer sites. 
We've just done an evaluation of the 20 years of the World Monuments Watch. And uh, like Stephanie's list, only about 2% actually get lost or, or don't mm -hmm. uh, experience any, any gain, and about 80% do. Mm -hmm. So this public advocacy and engaging the public is a really important part of defending buildings, even if they're not in your own physical environment. I was asked earlier um, by someone maybe here right now whether uh, the name of your award being the Hadrian Award, whether Hadrian's Wall in the north of England uh, required any World Monuments support. Well, Hadrian's Wall is actually quite well taken care of. And it's, uh, it's got some durability if it's lasted mm -hmm. this long. But the monuments at Tivoli have been on our watch, uh, largely because of industrial development, believe it or not, right within the context of this most important of all Roman mm -hmm. uh, landmark, uh, not Roman, but Italian uh, Roman period landmarks, which is quite incredible. Stephanie, do you find fundraising a little easier these days um, because there is more of an awareness of the value of preservation? Because you are privately we are. funded. We are privately funded. Fundraising is never easy. <laughs> I would say that. And I think now is a particularly interesting time to be raising money because we're having an, an intergenerational shift. So the organizations like ours, and I suspect the World Monuments Fund is similar, have for a long time derived a lot of support through direct mail, a membership program with a magazine and, and certain benefits. What we're finding now, and it's actually very encouraging, but it's a little bit tricky, is that as the millennials, who are very interested in preservation, I've been told are more interested in history than any other generation ever in the United States, are very interested in the outcome of preservation. We're working to engage them through social media so that they can become active along many of the same lines that Bonnie just described, petitions, letter writing campaigns, showing up at events and that kind of thing. And now what we're trying to do is figure out how to engage that group philanthropically. They are not members like my parents. Mm -hmm. They're not going to join something for a magazine, but it's a very generous audience. And so every nonprofit organization that's like ours is figuring out how to balance these two audiences as we move forward. So it's an interesting time philanthropically. World Monuments uh, Fund now is celebrating 50 years, and over that duration there were 600 projects. Uh, one of them was um, in the Forbidden City, in Beijing, um, it was uh, the retirement palace of an emperor, an 18th century emperor, who had served, uh, I believe, 60 years, a few more than, um, than, than, than you have. And it was a very charmingly named studio in it um, that he built for himself, and he called it the studio of exhaustion from public service. <laughs> so I'm just wondering uh, whether there is something similar uh, uh, awaiting Am I going to you? retire into the studio of exhaustion? Well, uh, well I'm actually going there next week oh. uh, in order to cut the ribbon uh, for, for the completion of the second stage of our work oh. uh, at that site. But um, no, I think that there are some tantalizing issues out there that it might be possible to drill down on in kind of an intellectual way without being so much engaged on the front lines of preservation. So I don't think I've yet reached such a point of exhaustion that it's going to be <laughs> the end of the career. I think we all need one of those, don't we? Yes, yeah. <laughs> maybe we could do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you.